Well, it's a real pleasure to be here. And I'll, I'll tell you about uh, some things that have happened in the past year with gravitational waves. Well, at least I'll try to. It should, it should work now. Sorry, it just gets stuck. Oh, OK. OK, so uh, my talk is going to begin by reviewing some of the basics, uh, the way we approach uh, gravity and amplitudes, and also uh, the connection of amplitudes and gravitational waves. And then I'll talk about some recent progress. Uh, there'll be uh, three points that I'll be making uh, progress at high orders radiation and spin. Uh, unfortunately, I'll be a little bit pressed for time because I also want to speak about the feedback to amplitude. So when you go off on an adventure and the adventure is very challenging, then you can learn a lot. And what you can learn, you can bring back to the shores, the place you came from. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk about uh, improved integration programs. This is something bread and butter for, say, collider physics. I'll talk about creating a basis of integrands, and that includes the non-planar and how we use it. And one of the uses would is, now we now understand how to do double copy to all loop orders, and I'll explain how that works. Okay, so as we all know, the uh, era of gravitational wave astronomy has, has begun. Uh, and, of course, in the amplitudes community, we really wanted to help out. So I'll say a little bit about that, and there's going to be a further talks on, on this in, uh, just after mine. So uh, the first thing is, uh, for those who, who haven't seen this before, you might find it very surprising that scattering amplitudes can uh, say something about gravitational waves because the problems are quite different. Let's say if we're interested in collider physics, which is the natural place for quantum scattering amplitudes, we're talking about something very different. Uh, first, it's unbound trajectories, it's gauge theories, QCD, electroweak theory, quantum field theory. And this is, looks quite different. We're talking about bounded orbits. Generally, also we're using general relativity. It's classical physics. And they look like completely different problems. But in fact, they're really the same problem. And the reason is because of a separation of scales. If you're looking at the problem of black hole coalescence, as long as the black holes are well separated and you have long wavelength radiation, then for practical purposes, these are points. If these are points, then it's in our wheelhouse. And we can apply everything that we learned uh, from quantum field theory to this problem of gravitational waves. So the normal way of approaching Einstein gravity is, of course, to use the Einstein field equation and geometry. And anyway, you all know the story of that. Uh, that's not how we do it in amplitudes. In amplitudes, we start from the following idea. Gravitons are spin two particles. And just from that alone, you can derive a complete set of equations that you can use to solve problems, specifically in perturbation theory. This is not suited for all problems. Because as soon as you say these words, then you're thinking perturbative. But it's very well suited to gravitational wave physics from compact astrophysical objects. And the basic way we start, in case there's anyone here not in amplitudes, is uh, we look at the three-point amplitudes and we write down vertices that are subject to certain constraints. Maybe if you're using a d-dimensional formalism, you might think about gauge invariance, which is, in fact, how Feynman thought about it. Uh, and and th th this is the unique vertex that you can write down in Yang, in Yang Mills theory. It's the unique vertex you can write down in Einstein gravity if you're thinking about on-shell gravitons. You shouldn't think about off-shell ones for, for this purpose. Uh, and if you're, of course, we know very well, you learn spinner helicity. If you think about little group weight, it's the only thing you can write down of the right dimensions and the same here in Einstein gravity. And of course, we see the, the first hint of this double copy, the, the relationship between these two theories. Okay, um, 
And then, uh, uh, of course, I'm not going to go through this, but uh, there's all the different techniques, the BCFW recursion, the unitarity method I'll, I'll speak about because we use that in the gravitational wave problem. And using that, from this starting point, you can build the entire perturbative theory to all loop orders. Okay, a little bit about the unitarity method. It's, a, it's old, the basic ideas are old. Uh, and the idea is that you can reconstruct integrands in, just by looking at on-shell data. So you can build, build up systematically uh, higher orders of perturbation theory by inspecting uh, the, uh, the sewings of tree amplitudes. Uh, and then there's this concept of generalized unitarity. It's also other types of cuts where intermediate particles are on shell. And using this information, we build up entire loop integrands. Okay, and there's developments that go far beyond that at the integrated level. But for the purposes of gravitational waves, in fact, these pictures are from our paper on gravitational waves, uh, we use this generalized unitarity method. Okay. And a double copy is something that we use all the time. It's a very slick way of getting gravity from gauge theory. Okay, I'm not going to belabor the point, but uh, let me just point out a few things which uh, will be of some relevance later. Uh, so at, uh, at uh, tree level, the idea is that you write the amplitude in terms of cubic diagrams with Feynman propagators, this color factors, as numerator factors, color factors obey Jacobi. If you can adjust things so that the numerators obey the, the uh, Jacobi identity, then the statement is that you can get gravity by replacing the color factors with the kinematic numerators that you see in the Yang-Mills theory. Okay, um, and it, it's actually very cool because you see the two theories are completely intertwined because you see the same kinematic factors here. Uh, and, and this is uh, conjectured to hold at loop level, although there's no proof of that. And on top of that, it's, as you go on to very high loop orders, it can become very difficult to find representations of the gauge theory that have this property. And uh, I'll explain how to bypass those difficulties uh, towards the end of the talk. Okay, so what's the, what's the problem we're talking about? Well, we want to get to high precision for the gravitational wave problem. Uh, Alessandro will explain uh, much more about that, that problem uh, later in the afternoon. Uh, the basic idea is you have black holes. Usually uh, people are interested in the in-spiral problem, although mostly we're going to be talking about the scattering problem. Uh, and the idea is that as the black holes uh, in spiral, they radiate gravitational waves, and we can divide this into three different parts. This is us humans who do that because of our techniques. Uh, when the black holes are far apart, we use perturbative techniques. Then uh, at, at, right at the merger, you need non-perturbative numerical relativity. And then afterwards, in the ring down, you can go back to perturbation theory. And, and all of this has to be organized and imported into uh, models is effective one body that Alessandro will, um, I'm sure, speak to a lot about. Um, and uh, let me just outline the basic approaches because they're going to make appearances. At least three of them are going to, uh, 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 there's going to be a, an appearance, oh, especially, oops, sorry. I have trouble with this. Um, uh, especially this post Minkowskian and Self force. I'll, I'll talk about. There'll also be uh, uh, these other other others are important. So there's post Newtonian PN. So that's where you expand in uh, Newton constant and the velocity. That's very natural for bound states that are nearly circular. Post Minkowskian is the natural language for uh, scattering processes, and uh, the idea is just to expand in G. Uh, we who do uh, quantum field theory, we call this perturbation theory. It is just ordinary perturbation theory in Einstein's coupling. Okay, and there's uh, something called self-force. It's a, a curious name, but what it refers to is expanding in the mass ratio, but you stay exacting G 
when the equations become hard, then you go numerical. And this is a very powerful approach. Uh, and I'll talk about some comparisons between these two. And then there's numerical relativity, which allows you to solve Einstein's equations exactly, but numerically. It's very powerful, but very expensive. Uh, and it's the PM approach that we use because that fits naturally with the scattering amplitudes and the waveform models that are, are used, they import information from all of them. Uh, th they all play complementary roles, uh, as I'm sure Alessandro will explain. Now, why, wh what's the problem? So uh, I'll just be very brief here. The basic problem is that the detectors are getting much better. And if you look in the coming years, the proposed new telescopes, uh, gravitational wave telescopes, uh, we're talking about the sensitivity, it's two orders of magnitude. That's a lot. And it's a, really a highly non-trivial challenge to match this type of precision. Okay, it, it's hard to know exactly what you need until you actually do the calculations and you feed it through all the machinery. But it uh, looks like two orders of perturbation theory beyond where we are now. Okay, so what, what do amplitudes have to do with uh, the dynamics, classical dynamics? And the answer is everything. Uh, in fact, the first place you can see this where it's very clear is if you're looking at tree level and you're asking what's the potential, the potential that goes into the Hamiltonian that controls the classical dynamics, the answer is it's the Fourier transform of the amplitude. So it's very direct, very direct the connection between the uh, uh, scattering amplitudes and the classical physics we're interested. Beyond one loop, there's some issues. It's not, of course, a state, uh, straightforward. The first thing is that, uh, contrary to what many of you learned in graduate school, it's not the trees that have the classical physics, the important classical physics, at least. It's the loops. That's where it is. Uh, and and uh, if you actually look at the proper scaling where you're trying to answer the question of where the classical physics that controls the binary dynamics is, uh, the, the, the proper scaling is not that every loop has an H bar, it's every loop has a one over H bar. So it's completely backwards from uh, the way it's normally stated. Um, and there's all sorts of issues with uh, double counting and iteration. Uh, it, it, it's, it's really just connected to the fact that uh, the, the diagrams are calculating e to the i s classical over h bar. You expand this, you get one over h bars. And also there's iteration pieces, but lower order pieces uh, that, that uh, pile up just from the expansion of the exponential. Okay, so the task is to extract these classical pieces as efficiently as possible. And uh, so first thing you have to understand is where does the classical physics reside? And the answer is in soft gravitons. Uh, it's large angular momentum. Uh, and and uh, there's a scaling between this momentum transfer and the other variables like the masses and the kinematic invariance and angular momentum. And so the answer is large angular momentum, or we could say classical contributions lived in, live in the soft graviton region. It's also useful to further divide, subdivide this into potential and radiation regions. Uh, and, and this is a type of scaling that you would see uh, from in the method of regions. This is actually very common in QCD, this type of analysis, separating out different pieces. Uh, and one effect when you go to the classical region is it greatly simplifies the integrals. In fact, with, uh, these matter propagators, they turn into uh, linear propagators, uh, which are much easier to deal with. Okay, and, and uh, maybe one other thing is uh, that uh, if you look in the classical limit and you look carefully, you'll see that in fact, almost all the integrals can be planarized. In the world line, this was pointed out in uh, a recent paper or emphasized, I should say, since it's fairly obvious in the world line approach that most of the integrals are planar. And uh, then there's a few more that you have to deal with, uh, either planarize them in some way, or a uh, few of the integrals you have to face up that they are non-planar. Okay. 
Um, and, and just the, this is a very active field. I, I hope I didn't miss anybody, but there's really uh, quite a lot of work just in the past year even that's been done in, uh, in this. One is, of course, pushing to higher orders, more precision. Uh, we're now pushing towards order G to the fifth. There's, there's uh, uh, the problem of waveforms uh, that, that, uh, come out, uh, that, 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 that arise. Uh, there's um, finite size effects, spin effects, black holes can absorb the radiation. Uh, and, and all of this is being studied by various groups uh, using amplitude methods and related methods. Uh, and, and I should say in this list, there's really quite a collection of great young people. And uh, I've had the pleasure of working with, with uh, some of them. Um, so the connection of the unitarity method and the gravitational wave problem is actually pretty cute. Uh, the first point is we're interested uh, in the perturbation theory in long range, a long range force. The two black holes have to be well separated. Otherwise, the uh, effective field theory, the separation of scales doesn't work right. Uh, and uh, if the two matter lines are well se separated, that means you have to have graviton propagators here. Effectively, that means that they're on shell. And if you listen carefully to what I said, I didn't say they're on shell. I said effectively they're on shell. Uh, but for practical purposes, we can consider them to be on shell. That means if you, there's a, uh, you can apply the unitarity method very directly. If you look at the uh, order G squared, there's one unitarity cut. You go to the next order, there'd be three of them that you have to analyze. Uh, and the basic point is that, um, is, is that the unitarity method works very well. Oh, I, I forgot to mention that uh, the, the, when you're looking at the class, at the classical physics, and in fact, these matter lines have to go on shell because the energy has to be localized, otherwise you wouldn't get classical physics. Yeah. Now, let's have a look at the structure of higher order. So as you march down the, uh, the, the uh, higher orders of perturbation theory, uh, you start discovering new properties, new phenomena. At the lowest orders, uh, you don't actually discover very much except the Schwarzschild metric. Uh, the, the tree level, the one loop, you can understand entirely by just knowing what the Schwarzschild metric is. Uh, when you get to the next order, then something interesting happens. There's a new structure. Uh, in terms of this self-force uh, uh, um, organization, then we can, we can uh, uh, think of it as all the terms come with certain mass ratios. Uh, all terms could be extracted from looking at uh, certain certain mass mass ratios. Uh, and one of the like uh, curiosities you discover pretty quickly is that there's a poor high energy behavior, and that poor high energy behavior, uh, it's it's uh, it's been analyzed and it cancels against real radiation. Uh, but but, that, but that, that's now uh, pretty well understood. When you go to the next order then uh, some real fun starts, the tail effect. What the tail effect is, uh, in, in, in more traditional language, we'd say that the radiation goes out and then it can bounce off of the curved space-time and then gets reabsorbed. In the language of amplitudes, we would say that gravitons bounce off each other. Uh, and the fun that it causes is non-local and time effects. And that causes uh, non-triviality in trying to connect the bound and unbound cases. You also discover elliptic integrals, and also this I'm very amused by. Uh, you discover that whatever you understood at the previous order about the, the poor high energy behavior is just not, it doesn't continue. Uh, in fact, uh, there's uh, the, the, the poor high energy behavior is worse and there's no cancellation against real radiation. It's, okay. Uh, and then when you, uh, when you go on to the next order, you discover new sets of integrals that certainly appear in intermediate steps, kalabi yau integrals. Uh, there's, great, there's great fun in trying to separate conservative and dissipative. This happens in co the contributions that are 
uh, a further subleading in the mass ratio. And then uh, at the next order, uh, then you discover even more fun things, mixing with tidal operators, ultraviolet divergences. You'd be able to distinguish black holes from neutron stars at, uh, at this order. At the previous orders, uh, black holes and neutron stars, uh, d you don't, in the perturbation theory, you don't distinguish, you don't distinguish uh, between them. Okay. Um, and let me just show you, uh, this, is, uh, this is the order G to the fourth result, uh, is what it looks like. So this is an amplitude. Uh, it's written in a certain way in terms of something called a radial action. Uh, which is a classical quantity. Uh, and uh, probably the most interesting thing is that it's reasonably compact. You, you don't get too complicated things. You do get elliptic integrals here, uh, but they're pretty standard. So uh, that's not much of a problem. Um, and in fact, th this thing here is the complete conservative piece. And you might ask, how do we know it's correct? And the answer is we had some help from uh, our friends, Dini Damore and Geralico. So they were very eager for this result. So uh, they did us a great favor. They converted to our notation and they wrote a paper and said, when we finish the calculation, we should find the first three terms here. And indeed that's what happened. So then uh, that went a long way to making sure that we've done things correctly. Okay, and, and there's also uh, more work. There's uh, the result for the angle, including radiation effects, that's, uh, that's complete. There's, uh, the, the, there's some potential subtlety in comparisons to PN. As far as I know, that hasn't been fully resolved, but I, I think it will be resolved. Uh, and, and then there's a, a problem with the analytic continuation between the, uh, uh, to the bound case, uh, that's the tail effect. Uh, judging from recent progress, uh, just a paper, I think it was two days ago, um, it's pretty clear that for practical purposes, this is going to be a solved problem. Okay. Um, now, let's have a look at the next order, what that looks like. So, uh, uh, so, so, so this is... Uh, Okay, so the first thing is to do work out the uh, the integrand, and that's pretty straightforward to get the the integrand, whichever formulas we want to use. <clears throat> the real problem is on the integration. That's quite hard. There's two groups. We're working hard on it. There's the Humboldt group. There's our group, uh, and and then uh, uh, once you have the integrated results, the rest is actually pretty straightforward. Okay, and because the problem is hard, you want to attack it in different stages. So our first paper, we looked at uh, quantum electrodynamics. And then you can also organize the, the contributions according to the self force. Uh, so there's uh, the different stages uh, the, with the QED, uh, the first self force conservative. That was actually done by uh, very nice work by the Humboldt group. Uh, we, we just I had a paper on uh, N equals eight uh, supergravity. That's uh, the reason why we're looking at that theory it has to do with uh, lower rank, lower tensor rank makes the integrals easier to deal with. Um, and and I want, uh, once that's done, it, the two SF that's actually harder, but that definitely looks to be in reach. Okay. Uh, let me just say a few words about higher loop integration. Uh, it, it's actually quite complicated, the, this uh, this uh, problem. And the idea is you import all the techniques that we know from QCD, collider physics, uh, and uh, the integration by parts is the key technique. It's greatly simplified in the classical limit. And uh, that there's all sorts of uh, ideas about how to choose what are called master integrals. That's the basis of integrals in which everything is expressed in terms of uh, something that's very important are the prime fields and reconstruction. Uh, if you haven't seen this before, it's really magic. It's really wonderful how this works. Uh, and then, then you set up some differential equations. 
Uh, the integration by parts is just a trivial identity in dimensional regularization. The differential equations are you just differentiate with respect to some variable. And then what you do is you get some mass and you go back and reduce it to the, to the master basis. Okay, and, and of course we heard about that in, uh, in other talks. Uh, we use an upgraded version of the program FIRE. We have a private program, which we're still developing. And we also use other tools. The Humboldt Group, they use the program Kira, of course, an upgraded version. Now you say, okay, why is this so tough? The answer is, look at this. Uh, this is the integral that has to be done. Uh, and this is not easy, especially if you count the number of numerator powers, there's powers that you have up there. Uh, and you can, you can only do this by very carefully tuning programs or writing private codes. And, and there's a, a number of improvements, which I see I'm running out of time, so I may not go through it. Uh, let's just talk a little bit about the uh, iterated uh, integrals. Um, so we, we encounter elliptic integrals, calabi yau integrals, and uh, that's, that's uh, in great, of great interest for a subset of mathematically minded uh, amplitudes people. Uh, and uh, the, uh, maybe the punchline is there's really a great opportunity here for uh, studying these integrals uh, because they're simpler than the ones you encounter in collider physics, but they've got all the fun integrals that you guys love. Uh, here, here's uh, this is from our paper. Uh, there's actually something really cute here, which is uh, the most important thing is how simple this is. Uh, in fact, if, if you look in here, you'll see there's only a polylog. There's no elliptic integral. What happened to the elliptic integrals, right? They were there at lower order. Uh, 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 and uh, and you, you might have expected, you certainly might have expected them to appear here, but anyway, they're, they're not there. And that also was seen in the general relativity of the first cell force, uh, also they found it to be much simpler than they might have expected because those elliptics canceled. Okay. Now, uh, let me just switch gears, just uh, talk about spin just a little bit. So uh, there's uh, really quite a lot of work on that, and I really can't do justice, but let me just point out a few things. So, so here, here's a, a basic question. Uh, how does a graviton couple to a massive spinning object? And the description in terms of effective field theory, uh, so here's the energy momentum tensor, there's a bunch of Wilson coefficients, and then you, you can expand in the powers of spin, uh, and, and uh, well, what happens, uh, which is actually very cute, is for a black hole, these Wilson coefficients normalize appropriately. They're one, so they're very simple. Uh, and the, another question is, well, what about all the other operators? Let's see here, I'm just talking about... Hmm. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened there. Uh, it, um, what about all the other Wilson operators? Um, uh, because here, here I'm only talking about the three point. In fact, there's an infinite set of other operators. Okay, what's their Wilson coefficient for a black hole? Uh, but it turns out that if you start even at relatively low order, so this is one loop, you very quickly discover some tricky questions. Uh, and uh, for example, in this, in this group, Batista, Guevara, Kavanaugh, and Vines. Uh, they did this really beautiful work using uh, Einstein's equation, essentially, it's really the Tukalski equation, but anyway, essentially they're using Einstein's equation, and pretty soon they discover non-trivial analytic continuations, and, and it, it's unclear about the separation of conservative and dissipative, and there's definitely uh, it, it has not been fully settled. Uh, there's also other more theoretical questions. The, there's an iconal interpretation. Uh, how far can we push it? And uh, my favorite one is the, uh, we discovered in our calculations extra Wilson coefficients. Um, 
And this is related to spin magnitude change in conservative general relativity. Normally, the way it's done is you don't let that happen. You impose what's called a SSC, spin supplementary condition, which throws away the extra degree of freedom that you find in the spin tensor. Uh, but if you keep it, then, uh, then, then uh, the, you, it's connected to these extra Wilson coefficients. In fact, it turns out uh, that there is a paper from quite a while ago, uh, 2015, that uh, appreciated this extra degree of freedom uh, and studied it. And, and this is something that we uh, beat to death in for the case of electrodynamics. And uh, we're working on a paper on uh, the case of gravity. Uh, okay, here, here's something else, uh, which is actually kind of fun. It's cooperation between the, the community of amplitudes and the community of gravitational self force. So I believe this paper, whoops, oh, oh sorry. Uh, sorry, uh, something went, ha went wrong with the order of, sorry, that was, uh, sorry, <laughs> a, wrong, a wrong cooperation. This is the cooperation between the uh, traditional general relativity approach for the waveform and the, uh, the, the, uh, the amplitudes community. Um, so there are four different calculations of the waveform at next to leading order. Uh, There's a, this a plot that I took from, from, uh, from this paper. Uh, it, it's just a waveform at some given angle. Uh, the, the details I don't have the time to go through except to say that there are four different calculations. And of course, as you can imagine, you try comparing them, you'll discover very quickly that it's not that simple. And uh, there's this um, very nice uh, recent paper. This is where these groups or some subset, they got together and they track down the source of every disagreement. And it's actually uh, quite fun. Uh, there's dimensional regularization subtleties. There's zero frequency gravitons contribute. And then there's non-trivial frame rotations to, uh, you need to align the results. You'll see more about this, uh, I think, in the, it's the next talk. And this is really a, a, a good example of great cooperation between amplitudes and the more traditional approach. Okay, uh, here, here's the self-force cooperation. So the, the gravitational self-force people, they solve Einstein's equations, say, semi-numerically. It's perturbative in the mass ratio, exact in G. Uh, so we can take these dots as truth, at least truth to what's called one self force order. Uh, this is not for general relativity. It's a simplified model. This is, I, I suppose, it's a favorite toy model of the gravitational self force people, where you put in a, 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 a charge and a massless scalar and it's easier to solve than Einstein's equation. And then uh, we did some work to, uh, to align with that so that we had PM results, so then they could do comparisons. Uh, and and uh, th this is from their, the paper that uh, just appeared today, where, oh, huh, okay. Uh, this is from the paper that just appeared uh, up, uh, up here today. Actually, this plot is not there. This they generated for me uh, to make it nice and easy to show. Um, and uh, what this shows is how you can import uh, information, detailed information. It's on the singularity. There's, the, there's a B critical where the scattering angle goes to infinity, and they can... Uh, they can uh, uh, have a, they have a detailed understanding of exactly what that the uh, the coefficients of the singularity, and that can be then used to fix the uh, the the non perturbative region. I mean, when the thing diverges, you can fix exactly the details of that, and you can use that to improve the perturbation theory resummation. It, it's very analogous to what's done in effective in the EOB, the effective one body. See, this is uh, using the geodesic, and then this extra information 
and gives you a perfect match between the three sum post Minkowskian and the, uh, th that's, that's this curve here, uh, and the um, self force data. And the self force data we can take to be exact, but, if, but within the context of the self force expansion. Okay. Oh, and I should mention there's another example, which is very cute where you can use these same types of ideas to reorganize the post Minkowski uh, in the effective field theory context. Uh, and you might ask in the post Minkowski, why are we expanding the Schwarzschild or Kerr solution? We should just keep that exact. And indeed that's what these people do. Uh, and that's, uh, that's certainly a good way of thinking about it. And it's, it's something that I think uh, we'll be using in the future. Okay, can um, uh, the, the final topic uh, is can gravitational wave advances help amplitude? So we know that uh, amplitudes can help gravitational waves. We've seen the list, effective field theories, unitarity, double copy, advanced integration, descriptions of spin, but can you go the other way? And that's what I wanna show you now, but in fact you can. Well, the first way of course is integration. If you improve these programs, uh, in fact, we've got, uh, for the problem we're looking at, it's, it's a factor of a thousand at least on the speed that we've got fire running now. Uh, and, and I'm sure there's been very similar improvements uh, in, in, uh, with Kira. Uh, what about the integrands? Now, when you're doing hard problems, you'd like to have as clean an integrand as you can, you, you can have. You want to push that as far as possible because you don't want to do any unnecessary integrals. So I'm going to show you an integrand basis that includes non-planar. Uh, the fact that you have a basis, it's going to trivialize the cut merging. Uh, basically, you can read off the integrand just by looking at the cuts directly, and you don't have to uh, solve any linear equations or do anything else to construct the uh, the merged integrand. And then uh, using that idea, it then becomes very straightforward to do the BCJ double copy to all loop orders. Okay, what's this integrand basis? In fact, the idea is very simple. Uh, so let's say you have two integrals. And then in the numerator, uh, once you write it in terms of this inverse propagator basis, these are inverse propagators. Uh, and there's ISP, that's the irreducible scalar product that can't be written in terms of the, uh, 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 in, in terms of this. Um, then uh, th these, these things um, uh, it, uh, can generate the same integral. So what you have to do is collect all the contributions and relabel them into one organized labeling, and that gives you the basis. And the new thing that's here that we realized is that we have a basis. Once you know that, then you can do a lot with that. Now, for example, uh, the, uh, the cut merging, I only have a few more slides. Uh, the cut merging, let's say I have a cut, another cut, and I need to combine everything into a single integrand to, uh, to uh, combine the pieces. Then what you do is you map it to this unique basis uh, and you uh, just start collecting pieces and you don't double count, but that's the normal rule of cut merging. If you see a contribution, you shouldn't count it twice. Maybe I pick it up this one from here uh, and, and I pick up another contribution, uh, uh, let's say from this one, I don't count it from there uh, and, the, and then so on and so forth. And we could say the map cut term is equal to the map integrand and that's an equal sign, okay? And that's, that's uh, really cute. Uh, and these ideas, there's echoes of this throughout the literature, the inverse propagator basis, you can find this uh, in, in, in integration by parts, uh, the multi-loop cut merging, that's very old. Uh, there's uh, uh, ideas of finding a basis. You can also find that in the literature. Uh, what makes this slick is how easy in general this is. So first gauge invariance is manifest. Once you do this mapping, there ain't no more gauges. You start in any gauge, you start in any formalism, you're gonna map to the same place. The integrand is unique. 
up to these choices of ISPs and labels. Okay? Once you fix that, you have a basis, and you're always going to wind up at the same place. This meshes very nicely with integration by parts. You, you, can, uh, you can stay on the cuts all the way to the end. Uh, and this is the last thing I want to show you. It bypasses difficulties with finding multi-loop BCJ integrands uh, so that we can now do the double copy to all loop orders. And the way it works is that the finding uh, BCJ numerators on a cut, that's trivial because the trees all satisfy it. The trees satisfy it, the cuts satisfy it. You can also insert projectors to control the spectrum. For example, in general relativity, we don't like the dil dilaton, which appears in the double copy, so we just remove it. It's that simple. And it bypasses all the grief we've had in the past with trying to find a very high orders. Say there's five loops. We had quite a bit of grief with n equals four super Yang Mills theory in order to do n equals eight supergravity. Uh, that grief is now in the past. Uh, and and uh, in fact, this uh, the fifth post Minkowski and Einstein gravity integral. This is precisely how we construct it, using this idea. Uh, so there's no need to uh, to bother finding multi-loop BCJ integrands. It's still a problem. We don't know how to do it, but we don't really care anymore because we can do the double copy to all loop orders in a slick way. Multi-loop supergravity awaits. The grief we've been having with that, much of that is now bypassed, and I think we're going to we're, we're going to go on, and we're going to uh, have a look at this question of these enhanced ultraviolet cancellations. Uh, I think probably in Renata's talk he spoke about that. Okay, here's my conclusions. Uh, and this problem of gravitational waves it really pushes the limits of technical and conceptual issues in amplitudes. And uh, over the past year, we've seen major progress in various directions, high orders, spin, radiation. And, and I really like this subtlety resolution by cooperating with uh, people in the, in the gravitational wave community. Uh, and then you know, more cooperation, where you can use the uh, cell force information in order to improve the perturbation theory of the post minkowski and uh, there's also absorption uh, by black holes which i didn't have the time to discuss and then uh, the final thing is the, the the this is feeding back now into amplitudes we now have improved integration programs we have uh, a simple non-planar integrand basis it trivializes the cut merging and in particular, it gives us the double copy to all loop orders. And I'd say judging from the pace of progress and many eager young people, uh, we can expect many more results in the coming years. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Sri. Um, is this is time for a question or two. It's one of them. Uh, maybe I missed something, but it seemed like you said that one function was simpler at uh, was it four p.m. than at uh, three p.m. Yes, is and it's the same order in the self force expansion. Yes. So uh, do you have an understanding of that? Yes. <laughs> it, there's a, there's an extra log q in front. <laughs> That's all one. <laughs> anyway. One logarithm got eaten. I mean, the simplicity is surely connected to that. Uh, it, it's uh, e even uh, loop orders versus odd loop orders. So it's it's good to work at even loop orders. One last question. So you mentioned this case where the elliptics actually cancel in some higher uh, corrections. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any idea of like when that can happen, or if there's some mechanism that 
actually well, helps well, that happen. Yeah, more. it's connected to Lance's question. Um, so th there's a difference between even and odd loop orders. There's an extra log Q that you find in the even orders, and that that basically suppresses complicated things. Now, why it specifically it, it worked as easily as that, um, you know, the, there there you have to actually look at more in the details of how the the uh, the uh, differential equations and what the solutions look like. But the the basic origin of the simplicity is that uh, even loop orders are better or simpler. All right, let's thank Tui again for a wonderful talk.